one. <sighs> okay, so I have mentioned this in multiple videos that I've done that I was eventually going to do one on the side effects and slash medication. So this is what this one is. So I've hinted at a lot of the side effects, some in more detail than others, and I'm going to talk about them um, like the long term or like longer term side effects. So of course, like in the chemotherapy video, I discussed the, the side effects when I was going through treatment. Radiation, you know, I, of course I discuss the, the side effects when I was going through the treatment, but now I'm going to discuss the more long term or lifelong <laughs> side effects that have occurred because of cancer treatment. So just like before, I have a little list, so if I'm looking down a little bit, I'm just, I wanted to make sure that I didn't forget anything. And in fact, um, just as with the chemo video, I might start this thinking it's gonna be one video, and then maybe I realize midway through I'm gonna make a part two. So, you know, <laughs> we'll just, we'll see how it goes. Um, so once again, if you are watching this, please make sure to that you have watched the previous videos because there is like kind of a timeline, and if I make a reference to something from another video like it'll make sense to you so just let me think okay so to recap there was I did a video on my actual diagnosis I did a video on chemotherapy part one and part two I did a video on surgery I had two surgeries and then I did a video on radiation <clears throat> so now like I said <clears throat> this is going to be the video on the side effects so multiple side effects I was trying to figure out how am I going to start talking about them because like I just I think I just have to start talking and see how it goes because there are just so many and they're all kind of related to different things sometimes in multiple things at once so I have like I said I have this little list so I would say in general the the side effects are really due to either one chemotherapy two the medication I'm on or three uh, surgery so we'll go through this so the first thing with chemo so with chemo I know I talked about in those chemotherapy videos I discussed the side effects of like going through chemotherapy. So, you know, those are a multitude of, of side effects during treatment. Pain, excruciating pain, nausea, of course. The feeling, the other thing is it's hard to describe to someone who's never been through it. Like, clothing can't touch your skin, your skin hurts. It feels like you're just, your whole body's a bruise. There's a horrible taste in your mouth. No, food doesn't taste good. You, you won't eat for three days, then suddenly you'll be starving. You have difficulties with other bodily systems, so even going to the bathroom can be difficult. Walking for me was very, I couldn't even hardly walk. And, and like, those are just a few at the top of my head. And if you wanna know more detail, watch the chemotherapy videos. There are, there are many, many symptoms that I go into great detail about. But like I said, this video is gonna be about those long-term side effects. So for chemotherapy, um, the one that's probably the most common is something we, ref we refer to as chemo fog or chemo brain. So basically this is kind of what it sounds like. And I, and it, and I know for like a lot of, what's the word, like long-term um, medical conditions, often this can be part of that depending on if you're on certain medication or whatever treatment you're going through for that. This is not uncommon for, for many people, whether they have cancer or not, or whether they've gone through chemotherapy or not. So, so many people can probably relate to this. In a general sense so chemo brain or chemo fog going through chemo treatment this was definitely more prominent it is still lingered and from what I gather from my oncologist will probably link and there's no way to know if it could last five years ten years for the rest of my life but basically for me now everyone's symptoms might be a little different but for me it is and it might even come across in some of these videos, although I try hard and I, I think I haven't, I've caught myself at good times. There's one, I think it's on the surgery video. I couldn't remember the, the name methadone and I had to Google it and it was the whole thing. Now maybe you might be thinking, okay, sure, but maybe most people couldn't remember a medication name, okay. But this is something that I've struggled with a lot since chemotherapy is remembering, remembering in general. So I will say that I have what I would describe as major gaps in my memory, like my long-term memory, like stuff even before cancer. That it's hard for me, like recall is really difficult. And for an academic, this can be, you know, exceptionally hard. Sometimes like I know the information is there, I just have to really think hard. So like as an example, if, so I'm a paleoanthropologist and so I, I research the species that came before Homo sapien like in our lineage. So for example, like Neanderthals or Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis. 
And sometimes, even though I've said those words, that species name, probably 10,000 times in the last decade, I forget. And there have been times where I'm like teaching or even just among colleagues and I'm like, you know, I, I'm like, I know it's there. I, I, I try to not get anxious about it because I know that'll make it worse. So usually I just take a moment and I think and I really have to think hard, like the name of something. But also everyday items as well. So this has happened a few times. So I teach, I'm a, I'm a teacher and I teach virtually like this last year, I've been teaching virtually. But even before that, this was a thing virtual. It's not even like, oh, it's only related to virtual because it's both. like teaching in person, teaching virtually doesn't matter. I will have a hard time recalling even basic words. And even in like amongst friends, this has happened sometimes. Like I'll forget words for like table. And it's it sounds funny because I can describe it. I'm like, okay, it's that flat thing that you put food on or you know what I mean? Like I'll find way, like I can describe the word or whatever it is, usually usually it's it's some kind of noun. It's usually an object that I have problems with remembering. And I'm like, I can see it in my brain, like if it's a table or a chair or a car, like I can see it, but I can't think of that name, but I can describe what it looks like. So usually that allows me, to, if I'm thinking to myself or writing or something, that allows me to you know, work through it. But if I'm with other people, I can describe it. And usually they're like, oh, it's this. I'm like, oh my God, of course, you know. So there's that. Also, like, you know, I mentioned before with like, with forgetting, like, things that I should know, or you know how like, maybe this is specific to academics, but probably a lot of professional people do this, that if you're having a discussion in a meeting or something where you're like, okay, in your mind, you're like making a mental list, you're like, okay, I want to make two points or three points when it's my turn to talk. To talk. And so you're like, okay, boom, 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 you relate them to each other. So you know, if you only have like two minutes to talk, you can get through them. And while sometimes anxiety might hit just anyone in general, and you maybe stumble over those words, that can happen, of course. I will say that for me, it's much more difficult to have, to hold that info in my mind. Like, I'm surprised it hasn't come up more in these videos. Maybe, maybe because it's lower pressure, because I'm just talking to myself, essentially. I, I don't know, or maybe it's just random coincidence, but I've had this happen a few times where I, I and it's not even usually difficult information, you know, but I will have trouble holding that list in my mind, especially if it's detailed in any way. If it's just like, if I was like, try to remember like chair, car, table, I, like I could do that. But anything more complex than that, if I have, especially I have to relate things to each other, it's so difficult. And you might be thinking, yeah, a lot of people can't do that or whatever, but as an academic, this has never been a problem for me. And it's so much more difficult. And so working through my PhD has been a lot more difficult because even talking about my own research, because it's very detailed, it's really, really difficult for me to like on the spot, you know, discuss it. And especially when I'm talking to my advisor, which I don't know if he is gonna watch any of these videos, I'm not sure, but he and I have had multiple conversations about this and he's very, very understanding, but we haven't gone into like this amount of detail. I just tell him it's hard for me to rem remember. And he's like, oh, okay, you know, gets it. But even sometimes when I'm thinking about my own research or like my own like proposal for my PhD that I have to, I shouldn't have to remember, like I shouldn't have to like think hard to remember that. It's my own thing, you know what I mean? And it becomes so difficult. Anything that's a list of any kind or de a detailed list where the things are related to each other becomes like exceptionally difficult for me. So I found ways around that, of course, you know, making written writing down lists or if I'm in a meeting, I can, you know, I take more detailed notes. Even if I'm about to say something, I have them written in front of me, which is why, like you've seen some of these videos, I have a list because before I could have been like, oh, seven things, I can remember that. Or even two things, like no problem, of course, like most people, but it's so much more difficult for me now. This is probably something people don't realize about me because it's more like in my own head and people, I commented to people about it and they will say like, well, you really can't tell you, maybe you pause for a half a second longer than you usually do, but it's really not noticeable, which is great, but it's still frustrating for me that it happens and it feels like it's not getting any better. And also just in general, like little things like we, we in our, my support group, we talk about having chemo brain, like, you know, you put your car keys in your fridge or like little stuff like that too. I'm like, oh my gosh. So that, that one I can kind of laugh off a little bit for the most part, but I will say like as, as a professional like teacher, as an academic, having something, an issue mentally with, with like knowledge and remembering is, is very frustrating. So 
Another long-term side effect, and probably the bigger one with chemotherapy, was that I have long-term nerve damage in my legs. Now, as kind of like a back, background story, before I was diagnosed with cancer for about probably like seven years or so, I had horrible pain in my feet and my legs. Like basically everything below the knee, really bad pain. And when it first started years ago, I didn't have insurance and then I moved and then I finally got insurance. Kind of long story short, basically it got worse and worse and I ended up having to use a cane. I was in a wheelchair and we, no, we didn't know what it was. Finally, when I moved to Las Vegas, I saw a couple, I got really good insurance and I saw a couple of different specialists and it was very frustrating because it was like seven or eight years of dealing with this and the uh, neurologist I saw was like, oh, like I can fix it, like 80% chance I can fix this with surgery. I was like, oh my God, you know, he, he's like, basically you have a compressed nerve and he's like, I understand why it might've been misdiagnosed before as this or that, because it had been. He's like, because your symptoms are not, they're a little atypical, like no surprise for me, of course. But he, he said, you know, based on, he did some tests and stuff and he said, based on this, it seems as if this, I'm like fairly positive. And he said, the good news is that surgery, 80% of people have um, imp like major improvement. I could probably take all your pain away. And like I said, the pain was so bad, I had to use a cane. I had these special braces I had to wear on my feet. Um, it, it was a whole thing. And, and in my mind, I had spent the last nearly decade thinking I'm just gonna be in a wheelchair soon. And we didn't know why. And so when I hear this news, I'm like, oh great. you know. So I have this surgery. We do one leg first. And then you know, he said, we'll wait a while for your body to heal and we'll do the second leg. And we do the first leg and it was so crazy. I had no pain and I hadn't experienced no pain in like ten, eight, year, eight plus years. And so it was just liberating. That, that could be a whole video in itself. But anyway, I'm just kind of giving you that backstory. So as we're waiting a few months to possibly do the second leg and foot, because there's multiple locations for the surgery, is when I got diagnosed with cancer. And so I'm like, okay, you know, I, I was feeling significantly less pain because half of the pain in my, like only one leg was hurting. So I was already like, you know, feeling great. I'm like, okay, I can deal with this. It's, you know, I want to get the other one fixed, but so much better now. So obviously that gets put on hold as I go through chemotherapy and all my other cancer treatment. And one of the, the side effects of the chemotherapy drug, Taxol is neuropathy, which for the most part, for most people is numbness and tingling in, and specific to this drug in the hands and the feet. And so they told me this is a very common side effect. You'll probably experience this. And of course they give you, like I mentioned before, like in the chemo videos, they give you a list of side effects. And then they give you like a list of like the more rare ones. Of course I had, you know, one of those story of my life was pain, not numbness or tingling, but pain. I had horrific pain in my legs and feet different from the pain I'd had in the past but related because it's all kind of in the same area but clearly clearly different and I think I mentioned this in one of the chemo videos that I was screaming in pain and my mom was like on the phone with like the advice nurse like what do we do like because what do you do like they were like should we take her to the ER like what do you say she's in pain you know it was just like it was a hor horrible scenario that happened multiple times and then as I'm getting the tax on not only was I in pain a lot but I noticed that my left leg would just stop working. It didn't hurt, it didn't go numb, it would just stop working. Like I would go to step and my leg would be like, nope. And it would just like not work, it wouldn't engage. And it would last maybe five seconds and then I would be able to use it again. And so that kept happening. And then I kept falling because of that. And luckily I didn't have any really bad falls, but I fell a couple of times like on concrete. I fell one time in my apartment on the, on the carpet, but I landed near a wall and like hit my shoulder into the wall and a slight bruise. So I was very lucky that I didn't have any major falls, but but no joke, I, for like, it's gotten a lot better now because I was in um, physical therapy, but I would fall two or three times a day. And I got to the point where I could, I could, I would sense like maybe a second or two before what happened, or I noticed my leg would feel weird before it would do that. And so I would be more cautious when I walk, I'd walk slower. And it was like 99% of the time it would be my left leg, not my right leg that would do that. So I kind of knew to favor my right leg a little bit more. <laughs> and, uh, but I kept falling. I would fall two or three times a day for like a year. And I remember going into one of my checkups and they're like, do you have any, you have any falls lately? I'm like, yes. Cause it's one of those questions they usually ask the older cancer patients and like you have how many how many in the past month i'm like well i don't know 95 they're like what oh my god and i'm like don't worry the oncologist knows but it was just like it was happening all the time so they sent me to physical therapy and the physical therapy basically they said well 
because it's a side effect of, of the chemo, basically it can just do just nerve damage. And so I actually went, I ended up going back to the neurologist I had seen before. I saw another neurologist. I went to physical therapy and at the end of all of it, basically there's like, there's really nothing we can do. That it's just one of those things that chemo just fucked up your body. And when I saw my, the neurologist who had done my surgery the previous year, I told him the whole story and he said, basically, he's like, we could do the surgery again on your, the first leg we did it on and maybe do it on the, on the leg we didn't do. He said, but at this point, with everything that's been done to your body, I don't know if I could guarantee that we'd have the same result and it might just end up aggravating it more. And so I was like, oh, great, you know. So now I have the pain I had before. It's, it's not as bad. I don't think I'll end up in a wheelchair. I've had to use my cane a few times and I definitely have difficulty walking still. It's not as bad as it was before, but I would say it's a solid like 80, 85% of what it was before. If it gets any worse, I would be back like with, with a cane like full time. Hasn't gotten that point to that point, but it's also very frustrating that I had finally, after like I said, like eight years found the solution because I had been misdiagnosed and I got the surgery and I was pain, pain free. And then like literally like seven months later, I got diagnosed with cancer and then it just screwed everything up again. So, and like I said, I, you know, I, I went to this neurologist and they did like this nerve conduction study and they wanted to make sure like, they wanted to know was it my leg or was it my brain that was doing the signal wrong. And they're like, it's your leg and your brain's fine. Which was great. You know, nothing major. They, they, they did like a, a brain MRI. Like I had all these tests done and they did this. It's one of those things that they had to do this nerve conduction study and they, they like stab you with this, it's very thin, but this needle, like in multiple places in my leg and they like run this electricity and they tell you like many things that I've talked about in these videos. Oh, it'll be slightly uncomfortable. Fast forward 30 minutes later to me crying. Like that wasn't uncomfortable. That, have you, have you had a death? Like you, the tech will always say, Oh, it's going to be like a little uncomfortable. And I'm thinking later, it's like, have you had this done to you? Because it really hurt a lot. Like I'm crying, you know, it hurt. And also I think it's one of those things where after three years of being poked and prodded, like everything hurts. Like when I go get my blood drawn now, even that I'm just like, Oh, I usually like, it's hard because you'd think after a while you'd build up a tolerance. Like, Oh yeah, I'm used to it now. It's not that, at least for me, it's not that way. It hurts even more now. It's just so much worse now. Cause I'm just like, everything has been stabbed in my body. Like, please stop stabbing me, you know? So, so, so I, now I have this long-term nerve damage and it's difficult because I'm still on pain medication. And that's another thing about being on multiple medications. You know, luckily now with, with, with the physical therapy, they really try to help me. They're like, we can't fix the problem in your leg, but we can help strengthen your legs and strengthen your core and teach you the proper stretches and stuff to help that might help improve your situation. And so, and I would say it did, I would say I noticed maybe like a 15% decrease in some of the issues. I definitely fall less than I did. I would say now I fall maybe once or twice a week. And usually, like I said, I, I kind of sense, I get about a second or two before it starts to act weird and I can catch myself. Or now I've kind of learned to like, I just walk, I walk more cautiously all the time, but it definitely in general just has starting to happen like less often, which is great. Hopefully that continues to do that. But it's, you know, it's been very frustrating having that being in my 30s and, and feeling like an old lady because it hurts to walk you know it hurts to walk even just going to the grocery store like a 20 minute 30 minute trip around the grocery store I get home and I'm like I gotta elevate my legs I gotta get the heating pad out you know I gotta take medication sometimes in the days when it's really bad and, and like I was starting to say a second ago the other thing about being on pain medication before or after like during chemo of course I was on and then even after I was on it for a while because I was just in pain all the time and I, I definitely very quickly was able to taper off of it for the most part which um, it's great. Like obviously the pain medication really helps with the pain, but I don't want to be like, I already take a gazillion pills a day. I don't want to be on something else. And then of course, like with me, as most people with certain types of pain medication, it can help with the pain, but then it leaves you feeling really tired or nauseated or, you know, it's like, okay, I want to be functional in my life. Being in pain all the day, all, all day isn't, I'm not functional, but also being asleep all day or being nauseated, I'm not functional either. So I have to like pick and choose, you know? So luckily my, my oncologist was like, okay, we can, you know, give you a lower dose of this because we know this, because there was like trial and error about all the different pain medications. We found one that worked really well that didn't really aggravate my stomach as much, didn't make me as tired, didn't help with the pain as much, but I was like, I can deal with that. I can deal with being at a level three in pain and, and not being sleepy all the time versus like a level seven, you know what I mean? So it was like, this has to be how it is, but 
Okay, so so I'm already at 20 minutes and I've only made it through, well, not even half, we'll, we'll see. Okay, I didn't wanna do it. I, wanted, I really wanted to keep it to one video, but okay. So the other thing, medications. So I'm on multiple medications. I am on an estrogen blocker. So I think I mentioned this before in the in the chemotherapy video that my, or maybe in my initial diagnosis video, my cancer is estrogen positive, which means as a female, hold on. Any estrogen that my body naturally produces is basically food for cancer. So right away, they're like, we need to stop your body from producing estrogen, which for those of you who are not aware how it works, basically that put me in menopause that put me in menopause at like you know when I started taking it menopause at 35 and you know now I'm 38 but it's artificial menopause but it's still menopause so I'm out all the symptoms because I'm on an estrogen blocker and they first gave me this one pill called tamoxifen and I started getting a period after about six months of taking it so they're like nope it's not working or it's not working fully so they switched me to um, a medication called anestrozole and paired that with a monthly shot of Lupron. So those are both estrogen blockers and the side effects are horrible. And so I, I get all the great, you know, side effects of menopause, like hot flashes. And I, those are more annoying and uncomfortable, you know, but like I kind of as to make it a little more lighthearted, I'll say like one time I got a hot flash, I was in Target. And if we, like, it's hard to describe, and everyone kind of experiences them differently, but for me, a hot flash, I feel like from the chest up, I feel like my head's in an oven. And it's just like, I can't breathe almost. And I was in Target one time and I started having hot flash and I went to the freezer section and like literally put the half of my body into the freezer section and for like two or three minutes. And I was like, oh my God. You know, even now at home, I'll do that with my head in the freezer and I just like will lay there, or not lay there, but like, you know, rest there for a minute. And I have these like, um, I have ice packs I use, I'll put on my neck or my head. Or I have like one of those like eye masks that you put in the freezer. I, I like put that on my face. I'm like, okay. You know, if I have a soda, I'm like, oh, you know, because it just usually for me, it's like the chest up. So I put it on my neck or my face and, and it starts to cool me down. So those, those were happening all the time. And then night sweats. And when I say night sweats, I, I know everyone experiences them differently. But for me, it was literally like I would wake up and I'm not exaggerating this. Like someone had thrown like a bucket of water on me. Like I would be soaking wet. And I remember thinking it's happened. It used to happen all the time. It was like, how did I not wake up before this point? Like, this is when I woke up, you know, I'd just be like, oh my God. So, you know, and, and the, they told me, we don't know how long you'll be experiencing these because everyone kind of experiences them at different, you know, for different lengths of time. It could be, you know, six months, it could be two years. And over time they started to decrease, but I was really still experiencing them even until recently, like very often, like, like hot flashes, like at least one or two a day night sweats, you know, a few a week. And so I, uh, but I can't take like a lot of women who are going through menopause, they can take like over the counter things to supplement the estrogen. And I can't take any of those because I can't take estrogen. So I, I was like, what, what's left? Like I have to be able to alleviate some of this. And so I started taking a natural supplement called black cohosh. And I know that some women have had uh, positive results with that. And I thought, well, it can't hurt. It's, you know, I'll try it. And I was on it for about a month. And it was one of like many medications I was taking. I wasn't even really thinking about it because I was just taking all these pills every day. And my oncologist, when I saw her for a checkup, she's like, so how's the black cohosh? Did you start taking it? How is that affecting your uh, night sweats and, and hot flashes? And I was like, you know what? I haven't had a night sweat in almost a month. And she's like, really? And I was like, I hadn't even thought about it. And I'm like, and now that you mention it, my 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 hot flashes are significantly less too. Like maybe like cut down by like 30%. And I hadn't even thought about it until she said something. I was like, oh, oh, that stuff's really working. Okay, cool. So I so that's you know one positive thing. Um, and it was like really cheap, you know. But so the other medications though, uh, so like I said, you know, I, I was on anastrozole for a while and, and Lupron and there's hot flashes and uh, night sweats, but also joint pain, severe joint pain. And when you start, when your body doesn't have enough estrogen as a female, you start having like bone loss. And so I have to take like a calcium and vitamin D supplement. And I have to take a lot because as a cancer patient, my levels of calcium and vitamin D and vitamin B actually have to be way higher. They can't be, they have to be above normal range. They have to be really high. And so I'm taking all these supplements. And also because of the, 
the estrogen blockers are depleting my bone density. I have to take all the stuff to make sure that it keeps it, you know, from getting so low because they don't want me to fall, which I fall, you know, at 38 years old and break my hip, which could totally happen. And so they actually, uh, about six months ago, I went in for a bone density scan and it came back in the low end of normal. So she's like, this is good. It's in normal. It's on the lower end. So I think she said they're going to send me in at like um, at the year mark. They're going to send me in again to just make sure I'm not, it's not getting any lower. Cause at that point, I'm not sure what we would do, you know, but so I, um, I saw my oncologist, this is back about six months ago. And I told her, look, these, the joint pain and the bone pain is really getting to me. Like I wake up in the morning and I, it hurts to take my first step. I'm like an old lady. My hips hurt so bad. My ankles, my knees, my, like every joint, just every part it hurt a lot. And so I said, I know this is part of the medication. This is a side effect. It's the most common side effect is joint pain, but joint pain and fatigue. But I said, you know, I can't, some days I can't function. Like there's gotta be a point where like quantity, uh, quality of life is more important than quantity of life. Like I know I wanna stay on these medications, but there's just something we can do. And so she's like, well, I can switch your medication again. Some people tend to do better on this one drug called letrozole. It's a sister medication to anestrozole. But depending on, like everyone just reacts differently to different medications. You know, she said, some of my patients tend to do better on this one. Let's switch you for like six months and then see how it goes. I'm like, okay, great. So of course, I'm thinking hopefully, even if they just, the symptoms just decreased a little bit, I would be glad. Of course, they did not. They increased horribly. And when I saw her last week, I was like, this isn't helping. It's worse. It's way worse. Like... I cry almost every morning just taking my first steps. Like, I, I'm, I, I can't walk correctly. Like, I started doing yoga, like some basic yoga stretches, to help alleviate the joint pain, like especially my hips. But I said this is becoming a problem that I can't keep up with. Like these symptoms, they're just destroying my daily life. And so she's like, okay, we're gonna switch you back to the anastrozole. And I was like, okay. She's like, and what I want you to do is take two weeks off. She's like, it's not gonna really do, it's not gonna be a major impact on if your body produces a little estrogen for two weeks. She's like, take two weeks off any of the medication. Or I have the monthly shot, but the daily medication. She's like, take two weeks off and then we'll start you back on slowly. And she said, I've had some patients I've done this with and it has helped ease their body back into it and their symptoms are sometimes, sometimes slightly less. And I was like, well, that's the plan. So right now, currently, it's been 10 days off of my daily estrogen blocker. And today was the first day I woke up. The first few days it didn't, it didn't make a difference. But no, maybe yesterday was the first day I woke up where I was like, oh, I, the pain is there, but it's, it's noticeably less. So I'm like, okay, hopefully I get a couple more days of that, not feeling like I'm in horrific pain in the morning and then, you know, build on that. But, but the joint pain is probably like, I know for, for estrogen blockers, you need to have hot flashes, you know, fatigue and fatigue. Fatigue is bad, but the joint pain. I could I could handle the fatigue, I think, if it wasn't. But it's one of like, you know, eight symptoms, so it's hard to even know, like, which one's the worst, you know. But in, in terms of the fatigue, I'll tell you, I sleep so much. And, like, there will be times I'll sleep, like, 14 hours. And I, my, I just won't wake up. And luckily, I teach remotely, and I teach college, so I don't teach every day. So that gives me a little more freedom with my schedule. But it's still very frustrating, you know, that sometimes I'm sleeping, you know, 11, 12, 13 hours, and I don't even feel rested. And I've tried to, like, okay, setting my alarm, I'll only sleep 8 or maybe 9. Maybe that'll help me. I'm getting too much sleep. It doesn't matter. I'm still exhausted every day, all the time. And I would say three or four days a week, I'll sleep 12 plus hours. And so... In terms of like time management of my life, it's hard. And like I mentioned in the previous video, I'm at the doctor all the time. So it's like having another job. Um, so I'm at just about 30 minutes and I have a, one more thing I wanna talk about. So I'll just include them in, in this video. So one of the main long-term side effects that I'm currently dealing with is something called lymphedema. So I mentioned this in the previous video when I was talking about radiation that my radiation oncologist had noted my skin sensitivity and my oncologist had noted the sensitivity that I was having with like my, my skin and the scar tissue. And she said, this is, she, it's been, you know, a while since surgery. It's been like at the time when, when she and I were talking about it, it had been like two and a half years. And so she's like, it's been two and a half years. You're, you should be feeling very minimal discomfort, if any at all, in this area, two year, two, over two years after surgery. 
And so she's like, I'm gonna send you in for a, a second opinion, another another surgeon. <sighs> and so I go in and I'm telling her about the whole thing and she has my chart and she's like, she's like, you clearly, because I had noticed this in the mirror and you can't really see in the video, I don't really feel comfortable showing, but I had mentioned this to a few of my friends and I'll just describe it to you. This arm, my cancer side, the breast, the arm, the chest area, the rib cage is all larger It's than this side, it's asymmetrical. Now, if I didn't point it out to you and you looked at me quickly, you probably wouldn't notice. But when I pointed it out to people, they're like, oh yeah, I can see it. And my doctors, of course, noticed it right away. They're like, oh yes, clearly this side is more swollen. And they took measurements and so they're like, obviously, yes, this is happening. And three, almost three years past surgery, that shouldn't be a thing. And I shouldn't have as much sensitivity. In fact, I had so much pain just from touching even my arm that my my oncologist went to touch my arm and I was like it still hurts so bad and she touched it and she touched it in just the wrong spot and I almost like slapped her in the face like because my arm just reacted like don't touch me there you know and we both looked at each other like oh my god she's like I'm gonna send you in for an MRI she thought maybe there was like a nerve caught in scar tissue but that's not what it was so anyway fast forward I'm seeing this new surgeon she's telling me a couple things she's like one based on my examination and the notes from your pre other physicians I think you have something called complex regional nerve no complex regional pain syndrome and she said basically when you have trauma to to an area of the body um the feedback the nerve to brain feedback just doesn't work correctly is the simplest way of describing it and your body just interprets everything as pain even things that shouldn't be pain like a gentle touch of your like your shirt or someone's hand will be pain 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 and then real pain is like oh my god you're dying pain and she said, you know, there's really nothing you can do. It's just, it's just something that happens sometimes. And so I was like, oh, that sounds great, you know. And the, the other thing, she said, the other thing that's causing, that's also causing some of the pain and the swelling is lymphedema. And she's like, you clearly have it. It's a more of a mild to moderate case. And I'm like thinking lymphedema, some of the women in my support group have it, but yeah, I guess I'm swollen on this side, but I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking they're like, it's like very sw swollen. And she said, well, they probably have a more severe case. Yours is definitely a little more like mild to moderate, but it's definitely there. And she's like, the pain level you're having is an obvious symptom. And so she sent me, and this is what I've been doing for the last month, is going in twice a week to a lymphatic um, therapy uh, facility, and they do lymphatic massage and some other types of treatment. And basically the way they described it to me, lymphedema is, you know, because they had to remove two of my lymph nodes. In the surgery and once you do that to a part of the body it can and often does cause problems with the way the lymphatic system works in that area and in general and so basically the lymphatic system it removes toxins from your body throughout your body you have like lymph you know nodes and and the the the, the series of connections throughout your entire body and it all kind of gets filtered in a certain direction through things like through your livers and your in your or your kidneys and then you pee it out essentially at the end but like for me in my arm, what was happening is it wasn't getting drained correctly. So I have all this like lymph fluid that's causing the swelling in my arm, my chest, my breast, my rib cage, that's you know causing this to be swollen and uncomfortable. And also what it can do and what it has done for me is something called cording, which basically it starts to aggravate everything in the area from like, you know, muscles to tendons to like all of that other stuff, all the soft tissue. And you can get really hard, tension in some of the connective tissue and also the lymph nodes can like basically there so i didn't know this before i got this diagnosis and i actually was in the shower like shaving my armpits and i was like oh my god what is that i felt what felt like a cord and it's so weird like later like oh it's called cording i'm like oh, you know of course but it felt like a small rope it was really tight it was in my armpit and i was like oh my god i'm dying and i didn't know what it was and so i literally was texting a couple friends like what do I do and they're like I don't know I'm like it doesn't hurt but this like there was something substantial protruding from my skin and I'm like it must be a blood clot so I went to the emergency room and even they didn't know and they ran they did like a an ultrasound and they couldn't find anything and I saw my oncologist like two two years two years two days later and she's like okay something's clearly going on and that's when she referred me out but so I'm going to the lymphatic you know the lymphatic treatment for this and and they do these series of massages, very gentle, and they kind of get the lymph fluid going in the right direction. They taught me some at-home ways I can do that to stimulate the correct flow, to get it moving in the right direction. And also they, they do some massages on the cording to kind of break it up. 
And um, so I'm going to be doing that for a bit. And I will say, like, after the treatments, though, when I come home, I usually, like, I have to pee a lot, which is normal. And I'm very tired, and usually it hurts afterward. During the massage itself, it's usually not too bad. And they actually have some different machines they use sometimes where you get a slight electrical flow. It's very, very gentle, so it feels like this very light vibration. But it allows them to kind of touch the area without it hurting a lot. Because if someone just, like, touches my arm like this, like, even that right now, that kind of hurt me a little bit like gentle touching is still kind of painful especially when it's like a very like a point of contact but when you have like a more like broader point of contact it's not as much you know and then when they use this tool that gives you a vibration it basically what it does is it confuses your brain and so i was having this whole conversation with you know the occupational therapist about this and she was showing some at-home ways to kind of trick your brain she's like because we want to get to the point where your brain isn't doing this feedback that's wrong we want to treat we want to treat the complex regional pain syndrome which can often, it's hit or miss, but she's like, there are things you can do at home to help alleviate that or try to trick your brain into like not overthinking pain, not interpreting everything as pain. And of course, then they want to treat the lymphedema as well. So, you know, they asked me the first day, they're like, what are your goals? And I was like, well, summer's coming up. I'd like to be able to be in a swimsuit or a tank top and not feel like I'm super asymmetrical. You know, it's a, it's a very superficial thing, of course, but I'd like, I already felt like an alien going through chemo. I'd rather not feel that way. But I said, but more importantly, I don't want to be in pain anymore. I want to be able to have, like, not have a shirt touch my arm and have it hurt, not have to, like, have a pillow position under my arm when I'm sleeping so it doesn't hurt. Like, you know what I mean? I don't want to be in pain anymore. Good God, I'm in pain all the time. Every part of my body, please, can you help with one area? That would be so great, you know. And the occupational therapists have been really great at this place. It took a while with the insurance and everything to get it all settled, but now it is, and, and I'm getting treatment for that. So, but that's been like, it was frustrating because they were like, you know, when did you have surgery? And I, you know, I tell them 2018, and they're like, why did you wait so long? I'm like, I didn't know. When I saw my surgeon for like, you know, it was like three day, seven day, you know, it was, then it was like a month, six month, or whatever. I'm like, she, at that point, she just said it was normal healing process. And I didn't see her after that. And when I had seen my oncologist, she didn't always see me naked, you know, and she just assumed even a year out, even a year and a half out, that general pain from the surgery was probably normal. But then, like I said, after two years, then it was, then it was like, okay, something else is going on. And there was a process of getting everything figured out. And I'm like, I didn't know. I, I, I just figured, you know, surgery takes longer to heal for some people. I had no idea. And the swelling wasn't so insane that I was like, oh my God, something's wrong, you know. And so they did, they took measurements the first day. And after like the third week, they took more measurements and I've had a slight decrease in my arm. So that's great. So, you know, even a slight decrease is like, it was like half a centimeter or something it is, is better than nothing, you know? So, uh, you know, I'll see how that continues to go and I'm hopeful and I feel like there was something else I wanted to say about the lymphedema, but I think that might be it. But yeah, it's just, it's very uncomfortable, you know, it's very uncomfortable. And this was another point I think I made in another video about breast cancer and cancer in general just being a lifelong journey even if you never have it again but especially with breast cancer because often it involves the removal of lymph nodes and that can just wreak havoc on your body like as it has with mine in multiple ways and so now basically I'm I'm at this at this state in my life right now you know I'm in pain all the time most of it I can manage but it's still I I say that but only because like I'm used to it in reality, I think if anyone else were suddenly introduced with the pain I have now, which now it's significantly less than it used to be. But I think if most people had the pain that I have now, they would be, they would not be able to handle it. So I pain every day. I can hardly walk uh, most days, you know, without some kind of help. Lots of stretching, lots of ways of reducing the pain, uh, be it like, you know, hot baths, pain medication, ice packs, heating pads, you know, um, wine sometimes. <laughs> uh, I sleep a lot, you know, a lot, or I'm tired a lot. And not like, oh, I'm tired, I've had a long day, but like the kind of tired that you just feel like in your soul almost that, oh, like fatigue, like you're, you're tired, but not even like, I could probably try to sleep and I probably wouldn't sleep sometimes, you know, like if I try to, try to take a nap, it happens sometimes, it doesn't happen other times, but that type of, that type of weakness to your whole sense of body, like, you know, just, I feel that way now. And 
so pain all the time, tired all the time, you know, um, having to deal with all the other emotional and psychological stuff of being going through menopause in my 30s, which in general, like for me, I, I never wanted to reproduce like my own offspring, so that wasn't a big deal to me. But so like in terms of reproduction, that's not a big deal. But but also just like the thing I thought I would have to go through like maybe in another decade or or more is something I'm dealing with now on top of everything else, you know. And then of course comes those other little things when you're going through menopause, um, like the more, you know, aesthetic things where you feel like your body's not getting the estrogen, which people don't, women don't often realize helps with like your skin quality. And and so I'm seeing all that. I'm just, So it's like, but I can only take certain supplements because of medication. And so it's like, not that if I had bad skin or my skin's blotchy or I, you know, circles under my eyes or my hair's brittle, like obviously surviving cancer is more important than that. But at the end of everything, you want to be able to like think to yourself or look at yourself in the mirror and be like, okay, I'm still kind of me. I haven't been completely destroyed, you know, and it's hard because you know, that's not true. Like, you know, it ha you have been, Oh, uh, <laughs> I didn't think I was going to get emotional on this one, but okay. So side effects. I think I've, Pretty much talked about everything in terms of this oh there's one more thing oh actually there's a couple things okay I might as well just mention them right, right now because it's not enough to make a second video wait I mentioned this before in a chemotherapy video but wait wait up down up down up down and at this point with the estrogen blockers it is so hard to lose weight I have been on really strict diets and I'll lose like two pounds in a month and so it's just like I've had to kind of just let it be okay with myself that I'm gonna be 10 pounds heavier than I've always been. And I've, I've still made drastic changes to my diet to maintain even that extra 10 pounds. Like, if I were eating the way I used to, I'd probably be like 30 pounds heavier. But I, I eat significantly healthier than I did. I never eat fast food. I make everything from scratch, essentially. Even when I want something sweet like cookies, I'll bake cookies at home. So it's not a lot of processed stuff. Um, I, I'm a vegan, so that helps. I eat a lot of vegetables not like every vegan does but I happen to I eat a lot of fresh vegetables and fruit um, so I'm getting you know with the right nutrients but it's been hard you know it's it's definitely one of those things it's just like, it's like one more thing you know one more thing that's not as important as the others but it's just one more thing to pile on top of everything else and the other thing is that after surgery I don't know if you could if you could see this on this video but they had issues putting in the now I'm blanking on the word the intubation tube and they told me after I woke up from the first surgery like we had problems putting it in little did I know it was gonna cause major problems for I don't even know how long I gotta talk to my, my surgeon about it we mentioned long story short we had talked about it briefly but it's gonna have to come up with the next appointment I have with her because like I don't know if you can see it very well in the video but I can't engage this side of like this muscle complex it, it won't engage at all now I, can, I don't have any problems like talking or, or I don't feel like I'm going to choke or like it, it doesn't functionally seem to be a problem, which is weird, but I can't engage it at all. And we're almost positive that it had something to do with the intubation tube. But now it's been three years. And so it's like, you know, like I already feel asymmetrical. This eyebrow's not there. This side of my neck doesn't work. This side's swollen. And if you notice in my videos, I tend to like sit angled because I feel like when I sit, even though you can't see my whole body, when I sit straight forward, which you can kind of see even just seeing my shoulders, you can see that this side is bigger. And I, so I'm always like, like that a little bit, you know? Okay, so this was probably one of my longest videos, but I'm glad I did just one long video instead of multiple. Hopefully it wasn't too long for you. A lot of stuff uh, side effects wise. And I really, I feel like I mentioned the important ones. There's so many other little things that aren't, that are just, there's so many, there's so many. And uh, I, the whole point of this was just that you know, if you are going through this, you're not alone. And if you know someone's going through this, this does not end after your last chemo or after your surgery or after your radiation. I am, I am three years out from all of that. And I am still, like I said, even last week was had like whatever, eight doctor's appointments in one week. So it is, it is never ending. <sighs> okay, <laughs> I'll see you guys on the next one.